Right, guys, I think John's good to go. Uh, let me hand over and uh, I'll make sure everybody's quiet. Um, so, I'm John Kelly. I work in production operations at Etsy. Um, I'll just wait for the last couple of people to sit down, maybe, I guess. Oh, we'll carry on, it's fine. Uh, so yeah, I work in production operations at Etsy, sort of the, I guess, sysadmin end of things. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a, uh, a situation we find ourselves in at Etsy where we basically had to produce a custom live CD. Um, and I'm going to share some, some learnings about that, basically just talk through how we actually did it, how you can do it. I'm going to open source, uh, there's a bunch of scripts that we produce to make it easier that are all open sourced and stuff. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Etsy are, your, your wives and girlfriends probably love us, some of you may not have heard of us. Uh, we're basically the, the leading online marketplace for handmade and vintage goods. So if you knit little socks, sell them on Etsy. A um, couple of numbers, because everyone likes numbers. These are stats from December last year. Uh, 1.5 billion page views, $117 million goods sold, 950,000 users. Uh, Infrastructure-wise, we're looking at around about 800 physical hosts. We don't actually run on the cloud, controversial these days. Uh, we have about 300 VMs. Most of them are KVM. We do have some Linux containers for our Jenkins continuous integration stuff. We are one of those crazy people Richard was talking about that build our VMs from scratch using Chef. Um, we have a mix of CentOS 5 and 6. We're moving everything to CentOS 6. We still have some stuff left on CentOS 5. Uh, this, is the, this is the kind of stack we use that frames what I'm going to talk about today. So we use a product called Rack Tables, which is basically our asset management system. Uh, it lets us track what we have in our racks, where it is. It lets us track things like switch ports, MAC addresses for interfaces, and that kind of stuff. We use Cobbler to build all of our systems. So Cobbler handles from OS install to bootstrapping Chef, and then Chef does the rest. Chef, as I mentioned, we pretty much do sh every, everything on our systems is basically Chef. After the bare metal operating system install, Chef does everything else. Um, so this was our old host build process. This is going back a year ago. Um, I made this slide intentionally small to try and illustrate the amount of pain this process caused us. This was really the only way I had to do it. Um, so about a year ago, um, our host build process, up until the point we started Cobbler and it started doing its automatic install, was largely manual. So we had to rack the server, we had to configure the ILO, that's, for those of you who don't use HP servers, that's the kind of remote admin console, it's called DRAC with Dell servers. Uh, we then had to configure the storage, we had to configure the RAID cards, in some cases that was quite a protracted process. Anyone who's ever used Mega CLI will know what I'm talking about. Uh, you had to configure the switch ports, make sure the switch ports were in the right VLAN, they were turned on, they were labeled correctly. You had to configure Cobbler, so you basically had to set up a profile in Cobbler that said, okay, this server is going to be installed with this chef role, this version of the operating system, it has these MAC addresses. Then you had to configure DNS, uh, forward, and, forward and reverse DNS records. Then you power on the host, Cobbler builds, profit. Um, it became, it, th this basically we, we outgrew this process. It was immensely painful. Building a server was quite quick because we had Cobbler doing all the heavy lifting, but actually getting the server to the point where Cobbler could install it often took longer than the actual operating system install itself. Um, because we're happy computing types, we decided to automate this out of the equation, so we wrote two tools. The first tool was Gabriel. Um, the backstory behind this is Tumblr uh, presented a talk at Velocity last year where they'd written a tool called Collins, which does all this stuff. So we decided to write our own and we called it Gabriel. Um, Gabriel automates uh, the switch ports, cobbler, DNS, and power on part of the equation. I'm not going to talk about Gabriel today because it's out of the scope of the talk, but myself and my colleague Laurie down the front here are two of the people who wrote it. So if you're particularly interested in this part, come talk to us afterwards. The other thing we wrote following a similar naming scheme was Sledgehammer. Uh, Sledgehammer fulfills two purposes. It configures the ILO on the server and it configures the storage on the server. Uh, that's the bit I'm going to talk to today because this is all running pre-OS install. <coughs> so just to recap, Sledgehammer runs before the operating system is installed and it configures the, the ILO on the server. It configures the remote interface so we can actually connect to the console and see what's happening. It configures the RAID card and it also configures GPT. Um, for those of you who haven't used it, GPT is basically the, the, uh, it's basically the new way of uh, partitioning disks. When we wrote this, the, the CentOS installer would not 
partition GPT disks for you. So we had to basically create those partitions manually ourselves by jumping out of the installer to TTY2, creating all the partitions, going back in and redoing the install. So we thought we'd make Sledgehammer do that as well. Fast became apparent because this is running pre-OS install, so there's no RAID configured, we don't know what disks we even have, that a live CD was going to be a good way to do this. Uh, it's memory resident, it's network bootable with a little bit of tweaking. You can convert an ISO to boot to basically PXE bootable format, which is what we use with Cobbler. It uses TFTP under the hood. And it's actually relatively easy to customize a live CD. Um, when I first went into this process, I had literally no idea how to customize a live CD. I'd never needed to do it before. I just took ISOs or you know, PXE installable images and went ahead with them. Actually, it turns out it's not as hard as it looks. So what we came up with was the Sledgehammer Live CD. Um, it's, it's a minimal CentOS install, and when CentOS say minimal, they mean like doesn't include DH client or Vim minimal. It's very, very minimal. We install a bunch of network and disk tools, so DH client, we install Mega CLI, HP, CA, CU, LI, whatever they call it, the HP equivalent. Because um, it's written in Ruby, uh, it, include, it includes Ruby and some Ruby gems, and it then also includes the Sledgehammer runner. What the Sledgehammer runner does, um, because we, it, take, it takes a couple of minutes to generate an image once, you've, once you want to build a new one. Um, particularly when we were developing this, we knew we didn't want to have to rebuild the image every time we actually wanted to rebuild the Sledgehammer component of it, which was really the only part that was changing. So what we have is we have a runner, uh, which is the only part that's baked into the image, which mounts a couple of NS NFS volumes, it downloads configuration that's to be applied to the server, it downloads the payload RPM, which is the bit that does all the work, and then it, it hands over to that. The payload RPM does the bits I've already described, configures ILO, RAID, GPT. It runs burn-in tests, uh, literally just tests the memory and CPU. We added that later because since we had it, why not? And it then also updates the system in rack tables, so it populates our asset management system with all the network interfaces, all the MAC addresses. It will also tell you what hardware it has, you know, memory, CPU, operating system, all that kind of stuff, and carries on there. So how does it work? Um, what I'm at, what it, was kind of in a little bit of a difficult position when I was thinking how to demo this to you because Sledgehammer and Gabriel are very, very specific to our exact combination of systems, which, also, which is also the reason that the actual tools aren't open sourced, although some of the scripts are. Uh, so what, what I've done is basically I've extrapolated the, the Sledgehammer parts to give you something that you can actually use at home that isn't going to require rack tables and chef and cobbler and so on. So a little primer on what live CDs actually do under the hood. Um, I'm skipping a couple of files here, I'm just focusing on the important ones. On a live CD, if you mount the, the ISO file, you'll get two directories, ISO Linux and Live OS. In the ISO Linux directory, you'll get initrd.image, which is your initial RAM disk, and you'll also get your kernel. There's another folder called Live OS, which contains a squashfs image, that's a compressed file system image, which contains the image of your root file system. The way the live CD runs is it loads the kernel and RAM disk, it then mounts your root file system as read-only, and then similar to what, what we were hearing about libvert, it creates a read-write overlay, which is essentially just capturing the diffs between the read-only file system and the current state of the machine. Once it's mounted the read-write overlay, it runs your init scripts, so that'll, that'll start your TTYs, it'll start all your services, and so on and so on. First modification we made, uh, so th this is, this is uh, the stock out of the box live CD behavior. The overlay that the live CD tools create is a fixed size. Um, if you fill it up, you basically can't write to disk anymore. The modification we made here, mainly it, it was slight laziness because I didn't want to have to worry about how many packages I'd installed, keep track of how big the overlay partition was. What we actually do is we copy the entire file system to tempfs and then we mount the entire root partition read-write. So we're just eliminating the overlay partition, we just have a read-write file system in memory. The second modification, which is the slightly more interesting part, is when you, when you run a live CD by default, it will create your, your TTYs, your virtual terminals. What we wanted it to do is when we started it up, instead of write, running a terminal, we wanted it to actually run the Sledgehammer runner. So that basically was a custom payload and we also wanted that custom payload to run automatically. We didn't want to have to connect to the console and type in, you know, run script or whatever. So how does that bit work? This is the start TTYs init script. This is what CentOS uses uh, when it boots up to start your TTYs. I've cut out a bunch of stuff here. 
but when I ping around TTY 1 to 6 and it's doing init TTL, start TTY, TTY equals number. So it will start up six TTYs, six virtual terminals. What we're doing here, um, we actually decided it would be kind of neat if we left most of the TTYs there so that if, if you have problems with Sledgehammer when we're, when we're running it in development and stuff, it would be kind of nice if you actually had TTYs there so you could still debug what's going on with the system. So what we do is we turn it into this. Uh, hopefully that's, that's readable. What we've basically done is we said if it's TTY1, if it's the first one in the loop, instead of doing init CTL start TTY, uh, this is my, my fictional one I've created for today, we're doing init CTL start CentOS Dojo on TTY1, then carry on and start the other five. Now this CentOS Dojo part, this is a this is a init script by itself, which will actually start up the runner. And what that looks like is this. Uh, all init scripts live in etc init. This is centosdojo.conf. You can see there we've done start CentOS Dojo. The, the name of that corresponds to the name of the file in etc init. So we're just saying it stops and run level 0, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6. And then we're running opt CentOS Dojo runner.rb. And we're running it under a piece of software called OpenVT, which is basically a way to start up your software in a new virtual terminal. Uh, so we're doing OpenVT. We're starting it on terminal 1. Dash W means we're going to wait for this process to finish running. Dash F means, I looked this up the other day, I believe it means it forces the TTY number. So if there's already a TTY1, it'll basically blow it away and put this there. Dash dash means that's the end of the open VT options, and now we do our now we do our runner. So how do I build it? Now this is this is the part that involves live demos, so it'll probably go wrong. Um, at best you'll get some useful information, at worst you get to laugh at me for not having recorded screencasts. So what I'm going to do here is jump over, uh, hopefully, I'm hoping the screen size is a bit small, hopefully this will be roughly readable. Is that font size okay? Can everybody read that, roughly? Um, live CD tools are controlled by a kickstart, the same as if you do an automated CentOS install, you have a kickstart that controls you know, disks, software packages to install, etc, etc. When you build a live CD, that works exactly the same way. It's built from a kickstart, and the only difference is instead of a CentOS install on disk, you'll come out with effectively a CentOS install to an ISO image. Um, so just going to flick through this quickly. You've got the, the bootloader part. This append to RAM thing, I'm going to touch on that slightly. This is what actually trips the copying the entire file system to tempfs rather than using the overlay. A um, couple more options I'm not going to run through here. These are our repositories. This is the repositories it actually used to, uses to generate the install. So we've got a couple of CentOS mirrors, we've got base and updates. Uh, this nanotechnologies.ca one has some updated versions of a couple of tools. We've got Apple. What we also have here is this, uh, this Sledgehammer repository, which is a local repository on the file system. Now this basically lets us inject our own packages into our, into our custom payload. Um, what we actually have, if I, if I just show you the, the contents of the, of the directory, Actually, let me just jump back. For those of you on the live stream or anyone who wants to play along at home, this is all on GitHub, all these scripts I'm showing you. Uh, if you go to tiny.cc tiny .cc dojo 2013, this is all, you can just git clone exactly what I'm showing you here, play around with it, build your own images. Um, it's also on, on GitHub, username John Lives. Um, so if we go back here, yeah, so you can see here in our, in our RPMs directory, we've got three packages. The live CD tools and Python image create, those are the actual tools that that do this. These are, these are updated versions. I believe they were from Fedora because the CentOS ones were a bit behind. Um, also we've got a custom, a custom version of Red Hat logos. That's literally just me changing the logo on the boot splash screen. Um, because we have this local repo, if you want to change any of the packages for whatever reason, you can just stick them in here. It'll get everything else from the main repos and it'll carry on. Um, so this is, this is now where we define our packages. Like I said, CentOS, CentOS minimal install is extremely minimal. Uh, so you know, we're installing a bunch of stuff like check config, root files, X keyboard config. We're actually installing Vim, DH client, and curl. It's an extremely bare bones install. It actually the the uh, the image that I'm going to show you today doesn't even have yum installed. It's totally totally bare bones. I uh, see down here we're installing CentOS Dojo Runner. This is this is actually you'll notice not in the RPMs directory. This is actually uh, because this is, this is the part that changes most frequently, this is actually something we build as part of the build process, which I'll come on to in a second. 
post install is where the actual interesting stuff happens. So we're defining uh, a bunch of devices in etcfs tab. Because this is designed, this is actually, we're using this to build hosts. We always know the host is going to come up using DHCP because we don't know anything about what the host's actually going to do yet. So for us, we literally just bring up DHCP, uh, cobbler, we, ba we basically have cobbler uh, using DHCP to boot all the hosts, which will then get their PXE image and do the install. So this is just manually configuring DHCP. This is, this is the TTYs part that I mentioned to you. Um, what this is actually doing is just literally catting the text I showed you to etc and it start TTYs. So this is our logic that says if it's TTY1, start CentOS Dojo. If it isn't, start TTY. This is creating the, the Dojo init job. This goes to etc init CentOS Dojo.conf. And what we have here is a rather large base64 encoded patch. What this is doing, this is the reason this is base64 encoded is literally because it includes a whole bunch of variables and it would have been incredibly annoying having to escape every single double quotes. Um, base64, if you want to actually look at what this does, uh, just stick it to base64 decode. All it's doing is it's the code that sets up this 2RAM kernel parameter, which lets us copy the entire file system into tempfs and mount it, mount it read-write. Uh, this is it's actually patching Dracut, which is the init RD sort of system, so it's applying the patch to the file, uh, it's doing some kernel module stuff, and then what we're doing here, we've got a little bit of a uh, little bit of other post options. What we're doing here, uh, there are two steps here. The first part, this is turning off. By default, when you build a live CD and Sense 6 as an ISO, it will include the kernel options RHGB and Quiet, which is what gives you that scrolling blue bar across the bottom of the screen. Um, for debug purposes, so I can actually show you what's happening, this, this is literally just turning those off. So it'll give you the full, you'll actually, you know, the full verbose install. Uh, we're copying init ramfs outside the shroot. This just makes the whole thing fit together. That's the end of the kickstart. It's actually relatively basic. Um, if, you, if you weren't doing any of that Dracat stuff or any of this stripping out RHGB options, really the only particularly bespoke part of this is the part that's customizing the init job. Again, this kickstart is in the GitHub repository. Uh, you can use it to play around with. You can add your own packages, all that sort of stuff. Um, so then what we have, this, this is the script that controls it. It's written in Ruby. Um, <laughs> this could actually be written in Shell, but the, the script I adapted it from does a bunch more stuff, and I was too lazy to turn it into Bash, so it's still in Ruby. Uh, so this, this is the script that actually builds the image. So we're installing a couple of dependencies, uh, RPM build, this is where we're building the custom runner RPM. Um, there's a, a runner.spec included. We've got this custom runner directory, which includes the RB file. I'm not going to show you what's in that because it will ruin my demo. Um, but it also has the spec file, which literally just says, and there's only one file. It's, just, it's basically just the how to put that into an RPM, where it's going to go. So we're building that RPM, just standard RPM build command. We're defining this custom CentOS Dojo root parameter. You'll notice I'm using that in the RPM. That just defines where things go. It's so I didn't have to change the path in too many places. It runs the spec file. Uh, it runs create repo on this local directory. This is this RPMs directory we have here. Uh, th this, this is basically turning that into, into now a repository that YUM can actually, that, that the live CD tools can actually use to install. We're now installing the live CD tools. So we're installing syslinux, syslinux, ext linux, and the Anaconda runtime. And then we're installing these patched, or rather updated versions of live CD tools and Python image create, which are actually what create the, create the image. So then this is now where we're now building the ISO from the kickstart file. Uh, lang C, live CD creator, we're passing it config is CentOS Dojo.ks. We're then giving it the FS label, which is basically the name the ISO file is gonna have at the other end. That, that's literally that one command builds the, builds the image. I'm, I'm going to run through a build just after this to actually show you what it does. But literally that one command will build the entire image from start to finish. It'll take you from a kickstart file to an ISO file with no, no configuration on your part. So we're doing a little check to see if the ISO file actually exists. Then we're converting it to PXE format. This is a tool that comes with live CD tools as well. It takes your ISO file and it produces a bunch of TFT boot, TFTP boot files. It will give you the it will give you a kernel and it will give you the init RD image. The way this works is um, 
for it to be PXE bootable, the init RD actually contains the entire ISO. So it's, whereas an init RD would normally only be a, maybe a few kilobytes or something, this one will be like 100 meg because it includes the entire, the entire ISO image that you basically want to, want to boot from the server. Then we remove some old files and we now say, okay, you can copy this to your cobbler server where you can now use it to, to boot from. So what I'm going to do now, let me just see if I can shrink this down a little. Got my VM here. Because I changed themes, it's gone and ruined my carefully constructed large font size. Let me just change that for you. Okay, there we go. So this is, this is a, a VM I, I basically constructed for this. You can see we've already copied the stuff there. We've got the Kickstart file. There's an ISO file there from when I created it last time. Um, but what we're actually interested in is build.rb. So I'm going to kick off that. Um, I'm going to just... I'm going to sort of talk you through what it's doing. This is all being done by this live CD create command. This isn't something I wrote. This is the default tool taking my kickstart and doing all the logic to turn this into a live CD. So this is, it basically downloads all the packages that it needs. Um, th this is actually doing the RPM build stuff um, in, in root RPMs. It's turning that into a repository, refreshes local repository. So now we're getting all of our packages. Um, yep, yeah, so it's getting all these packages, installing dependencies, building the ISO image, file system label CentOS Dojo, OS type Linux, because it's awesome. Right, so now we're downloading, uh, we're refreshing all, these are the packages we're using. This is like if you're doing the install, these are, th this is basically installing from a network repository. This is, this is what this is installing into an ISO. So we're getting all of our packages, there's quite a lot of them. Um, this will this will take a couple of minutes to run. Uh, hopefully, it won't take too long because the internet's reasonably fast here. It's now caught up with me. Does anyone have any questions while this is still downloading packages? Can I just ask? You to the mic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, stupid question. I, I use Clonezilla to do. Um, a rollout of a small number of workstations. It's quite primitive, but it is a PXE boot and disk uh, imaging utility. Do you have any checks in there to see that, um, just in case something went well with your TFTP setup, that there's already an existing OS on the disks? Do you do some sort of, s just in case, I mean, I know if you overwrote something, you could reinstall it, but. We actually don't. So this is, to actually initiate Sledgehammer is a manual process. This would be somebody either, so the, the way we actually do things is we actually have a decommissioning process when we retire hosts which, um, so either it's a new host or it's an old host. Uh, if it's an old host and it's been decommissioned, we wipe the disks already. Uh, because this is a manual process, you actually have to say, sledgehammer this host. Um, there, there's actually nothing to stop me from logging on, for basically sledgehammering one of our MySQL shards right now. Um, we kind of we leave that up to the, the, the ops person interested in self-preservation to not do. Um, <laughs> We, we try not to get in people's way too much by imposing too many checks and counterweights. We basically trust people to, to effectively do their job. What we do is we prioritize quick recovery from failure rather than trying to eliminate human failure, which is impossible. Uh, so let's see, do we have all our packages yet? Okay, so now this is installing all our packages. This is installing them into the ISO image, much like you would install them onto disk. Scroll down here. Hundred and thirty four packages. All right, there we go. Okay, uh, it comes up with this error. It doesn't break it. I don't actually know why this error comes up, mainly because it didn't break it, so I didn't really have the interest in fixing it. But you can ignore it. Um, so now we're actually this is now actually gonna build the build the disk image. This is building squash fs, which is it's basically constructed our root volume and it's now going to turn that into a squash FS, which we can then add to the ISO. Uh, again, this will take a couple of minutes. Any more questions to fill in the interval? So you mentioned um, that you use TFTP as part yes. of the process. Um, we all know TFTP can be a little bit fragile at times. Um, 
the way the protocol is designed. Have you looked into using iPixie at all to uh, make that a bit more efficient, potentially, or enable like layer three routing and stuff? So the question was, have we looked into using iPXE because PXE can be a little bit peculiar sometimes? Um, we've we've looked into it in that we know it's probably going to be a good idea eventually. We haven't, to be honest, we haven't had sufficient problems with PXE to prioritize it yet. In terms of building hosts, I mean, we've managed to build uh, last year when we spun up a bunch of new stuff in our Hadoop clusters. I think how many how many Hadoop servers did we build in one hit? We built yeah 140 Hadoop servers in one hit, basically all installing at the same time, which which we didn't have any PXE problems. So we we kind of haven't had the impetus to need to fix that problem yet. I, I've used Live CD Creator a bit, and I've found it uh, sometimes to be a bit failure prone. Have yes. you found that? Yes, I have. <laughs> so, simple answer. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons, actually, we, we ended up having, the other reason we ended up having to do this copy the entire fail system to TempFS was because under some circumstances, which were very difficult to reproduce, it would essentially produce a, a ISO which would very predictably kernel panic with no helpful information whatsoever as to why, but it was reproducible. I found it was, it was one of those, has anyone seen the XKCD where you have the, the person who finds a blog post from about 10 years ago and they're like, what did you see? It was that, that kind of situation. I found one guy who'd had the same problem who mentioned this Drake up patch, tried it and it worked, and here it is. This is actually, there's a bunch of other people who've used exactly this same patch. There's a, a guy did a GitHub repository which has much more comprehensive description of what it actually does. Um, but the other reason we ended up using the updated live, live CD tools from Fedora was because the ones, at the time it was sent 5.6, it may be that the, the sent 6 ones are a bit more up to date, but the sent 5 ones would also break un, unpredictably. Um, okay, we've got our ISO image. We're going to convert the ISO to PXE. Uh, this part's entirely optional. We're not actually going to PXE boot it today because, um, <laughs> because we're not. <laughs> so th this part's actually skippable, but th this is just turning it into cobbler. So you can see we've got PXE Linux.cfg. Uh, we've got VM, our kernel, basically. We've got our, in it, our D. So we've now built a new image from scratch. So what I'm going to do is copy this um, from my VM. CentOS Dojo dot ISO. And I'm going to shut down my VM because otherwise it's going to make this a very slow. And now what I'm going to do through the magic of computers is I'm going to fire up. So this is a, this is a kind of pre-prepared demo image. Let me just shrink this window a bit. Um, this is a VM. This is a VMware Fusion. Uh, this is our image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it to look at the ISO image we just created. So choose a disk image. I put it here. This is CentOS Dojo to ISO. Today at 12.03, so you can tell this isn't a carefully staged demo to maximize my chances of success. Cause do it live. Okay, so now we're going to, now we're going to actually fire this up. Uh, you'll notice two things. It, it, it is largely a, a uh, stock CentOS Live CD, apart from two things. As I mentioned, I changed the, the splash screen. Uh, again, this is all in the Red Hat Logos package. You can do that yourself very, very easily. Just substitute the file in 640 by 480, rebuild the RPM, splash screen changed. And then what you'll also notice is when it boots up, it will run the custom payload instead of launching a TTY. So there's my custom logo, because I can. So you'll see instead of the scrolling blue bar across the bottom, we'll get the verbo verbose boot this time, uh, just to show you what's happening. Loading them in RD. So you'll see just about just above the USB stuff, copy file system image to tempfs. This is the part that's actually copying the, the entire file system to tempfs and then remounting it as read-write. This will take a minute. Literally a minute, it shouldn't be that long. It's down slightly. And what you'll then get is it'll, it'll remount that as read-write, and it'll carry on with the standard CentOS startup process. So you'll get all your services starting up. This, this is very much the normal CentOS thing, bringing up networking. And we have the custom payload, which does that. 
So it's basically going to run through that. This is, this is my approximation of the sledgehammer, the sledgehammer process. This is pretend we're configuring ILO and disk and stuff. So what it's basically going to do is it's going to run through this and then it's going to shut down the box. So should finish in a second. I picked one of the good ones because we don't recognize the new ones because they're rubbish. <laughs> okay, so VM shut down. So this stuff's all up on GitHub. Uh, my GitHub username is John Lives. There's a repo called CentOS Dojo <coughs> Resources that shows you literally lit exactly the stuff I demoed just now. Same build script, same kickstart, same everything. The only things you have to change to make it work uh, is you need to change a couple of places where I've put the path as slash root because that's what it was on my VM. You'll need to change them. Run build.rb and it will give you it will give you CentOS Dojo.iso. Uh, if you want to change your if you want to add your own packages, all you have to do is add them to the RPMs directory, um, then add them to add them to the packages section in the kickstart, which is here, and it'll automatically add them into the image for you. Um, CentOS Runner is actually what contains the that the Star Wars crawl that you just saw there. Uh, what we have there, you could also do the same thing there. You have runner.rb, runner. Pardon me, runner.spec. You can build your own RPMs at build time. Or you can just throw a bunch of RPMs in the directory and have it do that. Uh, that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions? Two questions. Hi. Right. How did you arrive at the uh, the, the Kickstart file um, that uh, that just has the minimal um, packages that are required? Because because we did something very similar, and we the, the most minimal Kickstart file I could lay my hands on was. Um, it, w it had all of the Anaconda packages in as well. It was, I think it was aimed at doing a, a network install uh, of, of a, just a, a minimal server rather than uh, a, a live instance that you can just use to do one task and then um, reboot into your real OS. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, bu building that, um, we we'd be looking for uh, something a lot smaller than what we've got because yeah. ours has like 400 packages. Th this one works out, I think, something like... Um Nope, that's not what I wanted. I wanted CentOS Dojo. Uh, let's make it human readable. 181 meg for for that. Um, th the way I actually found the Kickstart, and this is this is, I could pretend I was you know incredibly deep knowledge of CentOS and I wrote it myself, but I found it on the Fedora Project wiki. Uh, they had they basically when I started this, the first thing I did was read the how to create a live CD tutorial on the Fedora. Wiki, which contains a bunch of template kickstarts. Literally, it will do an entirely minimal one, like none of these added packages. Uh, I had to add the stuff like Vim, I had to add in myself. So it's, it's, it's as minimal as it's possible to get. Um, I can't remember the exact link, but it's on, if you Google for like Fedora Live CD tutorial, they, they give you the kickstarts on there. This was very much based off that. Um, just as a pointer on that, there's a and I forget where it is, it's quite a while since I looked at it. There was a, a, a Kickstart file for creating a kiosk CD. Okay. And um, which was I found very useful as a starting point to actually create a similar sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and it, and it had all the post installed to starting up Firefox for a kiosk application. So that there's some really nice stuff up there if you start searching for it. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, main, the main reason we didn't use any of the kind of kiosk ones was purely because we didn't care about GUI. We knew this was just going to be, I mean, essentially, no one will ever actually see Sledgehammer running if it's working properly. The only time you should ever actually have to look at the machine running Sledgehammer is if it's broken. So the way, the way we actually use it is when the, when the data center guys are run up, uh, they rack it, they put minimal information into rack tables, basically where the two the Ethernet and ILO switch ports are, and also the Ethernet MAC address. Um, they run the Sledgehammer, because there's no ILO yet, we can't remotely power on the box. So they run their, run their finger down the rack, powering on the servers. Sledgehammer runs totally unattended, they never look at the console, and it basically sends out an email when it's done. Um, so there's, there's no GUI here purely because nobody ever sees it. Ideally, this is something nobody even has to think about. It just, it's, it's what happens when the server boots up for the first time. Um, but if, if we were doing a proper kiosk, that would absolutely have been, been useful. <coughs> Hi. Else? 
Yeah, um, a couple of points actually. And um, what you say about turning on the power is, is, the, is the very way that you provision um, supercomputer clusters. Yeah. You, you, you have you have to you have to somehow remotely power one on, and it gets the the DHCP server, and then you can start the uh, the bootstrap process. Yeah. Um, two point. First of all, you mentioned verbose boot. Yes. Uh, I've recently worked with uh, some up to date workstations which run systemd. And as we all know, SystemD is written by old Nick himself. Um, <laughs> with all this Plymouth stuff, I would advise everyone to edit their grub file and put in the, the boot equals verbose so that you get at least a fighting chance of it listing what it's doing because SystemD will, will not tell you why, mm. why it's failed. It will just sit there. SystemD failing? <laughs> no, uh, yeah. I, actually had that, I actually had that problem. I was debugging, just to give you a bit of a war story. Um, we were... So we provisioned a new, a new data center recently where we had a bunch of sledgehammer images, which were, that was expected because of, we thought that was expected because of new networking configuration, new DNS, you know, glitches. But then we started seeing the same problem in our existing well, you know, well understood data center. And what we were seeing was sledgehammer, the, the init process would run through, sledgehammer would then start, it would fail to resolve DNS for the server it downloads its config from and crap out. And we were trying to figure out what was causing DNS to fail because the, the Ethernet was the the Ethernet interface showed us up. What actually was happening on the I believe this was super newer super micro servers, what was actually happening was that it was taking when it did when it brought the when it when it ran DH client, sorry no, before that, when it brought the interface up, it was taking longer than thirty seconds for the, the interface to actually be up. And what we discovered was the timeout in init.d networking was 30 seconds. So what init.d networking was doing was basically saying, hey, this interface is broken. I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to bring up DHCP. I'm going to carry on. But by the time we got to debugging it, the interface had already come up behind the scenes, but I had no DHCP IP address because that part had failed. Uh, classic example of actually it not telling us what was happening very well. So what we actually had to do is in Sledgehammer, because Sledgehammer may now come up before there's any networking. We've actually, we've actually kind of rerun the networking step in Sledgehammer to make sure it's actually, actually working properly. Had, we, had it told us about that slightly more verbosely sooner, that would have saved me a lot of time. Uh, also, my second point is um, part of your process is to run mega CLI to set up your RAID. Yes. I've had to do a lot of that in the past. Yes. And also, my I work uh, LSI RAID controllers. And a lot of the time you spend going onto the ruddy websites trying to hunt down the, the command line package because it's not shipped in any, no. any distros. That's why we automated it. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I, th I really think there's, 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 there's a call for a standardization of setting these things up because... There, there, is, there is a standard line that is being developed. Yeah, that, 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 would, be cool. that, that would be very useful to me. Just, just to show you what we're actually doing. And this, is, this, is, uh, this is the actual... Uh, Sledgehammer comes under the Gabriel repo. What we're actually doing here in our repository is we are bundling, we actually built, because it, it by default doesn't ship as an RPM, we're actually bundling mega CLI in our local repo just so we know what version we have. Uh, so, I mean, basically what this is doing under the scenes is it's, it's, it's just automatically running all those magical incantations like perp and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we never have to do it because part of, the, part of the impetus behind this was when we were building Hadoop serp, our Hadoop boxes, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, have about six or seven individual six individual RAID partitions. That was incredibly painful to have to do that using well to do anything using Mega CLI is painful. That was doubly painful. So that actually that one specific thing kind of pushed us over the edge to we really need to automate this thing out of the way. But no, absolutely agreed. Yeah, at the moment, we also ran into a thing recently when we got some newer generation G8 HP servers. The version of HP CA CLI we were using didn't work on the new ones, so we had to bundle a new version of that as well. So. You usually find these things, are, you, you usually find these tools were built for some ancient version of Red right. Hat, and you tr you're trying to run it on a modern, modern kernel. And it just yeah, we, we didn't want to pay to have version 3 supported. It, you know, and it really is. We really, really do need a standard, standard way of uh, addressing these things. Yeah, it's definitely needed. I mean, really, I think if somebody just reverse engineered like a CLI and actually made it work in some kind of sane fashion, they would be doing the world a massive favor. Any volunteers? Uh, 
I see hands up. Well, I'm not volunteering to rebuild that. Um, I feel your pain over multiple disks. The Hadoop servers I build for my workplace um, are 25 disks on each server. Um, it's painful um, with HPA. So you're like, yeah, it's all scripted now, but the initial first uh, yeah. proof of concepts are painful. Um, but I'm sure I've missed something, but what's the reasoning surrounding building the whole ISO and Pixby using the ISO as, of, as opposed to just doing this all in pre and just doing like an NFS mount of the utilities? Um, quickness of implementing it, really. Um, th this was one of those things we discovered we had a need for, and I, because I was starting this from scratch, I kind of had to pick one approach or the other. This looked easiest, so I went with that. There, there's no... Oh, right. Sorry, actually, yeah, that's a good point. This, this is actually a separate process in the server build. So this isn't like immediately prior to the OS install. This will be the data center guy who's got a shipment of servers in. He's racked them up. He sledgehammers them. Then they just sit there waiting for us to use them for whatever else. So typically, the data center guys will do this part, and then we'll come along you know, a month down the line when we need to build new Hadoop servers, and we'll run Gabriel to actually do the OS install. So it is actually a sort of two distinct processes. Question there. Sorry, two secs. Uh, come around. Yeah. Throw it over. Hey, a uh, quick question, slightly off topic. You're using rack tables. Yes. Have you got an API to it yet? Yes. I used it he years ago. It. Oh, no. We, no literally, <laughs> literally. I'm we still wrote, using it again. We had to write our own rack tables API to do this stuff. It's a brilliant application, but it never had an API. Yeah. So that, uh, that man there who doesn't like doesn't like any public attention whatsoever. Uh, actually, actually wrote the Rack Tables API. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bunch of PHP scripts that do API-like things, but we refuse to call an API. <laughs> okay, so any more questions? Is it published? Is it published? No. No, no, no. You can have it. I'll just take it. If it doesn't work, it's your problem. Yeah, like, <laughs> conversely, if any the, the Gabriel stuff, like the stuff we're using to automate uh, Mega CLI, the reason it isn't open sourced is not because we don't want to or because we're not allowed to. It's purely just because it depends on rack tables, cobbler, and chef to work. If you're interested in how we're doing it or you want to see some of the code or any of that kind of stuff, come up and speak to me. I'll more than happily talk you to death about it. One little note, you said earlier you had problems with the um, basically powering up the machines via the ILO because it's not installed. Yes. You might want to look at Python HP ILO. It's what we wrote at booking.com to manage the 5,000 machines. And we had that basically that uh, we can power off. Machine is wrecked. Everything is automated. Oh, no, we, we can do that once we have the ILO. Oh. This is before we have the ILO. Let's talk later. I can tell you how you can do that. Okay. The, we, what we were looking at doing was getting like uh, Ethernet accessible APC bars or something so we can actually just power cycle the server. If, there, if there's a way to power on the servers without the ILO being configured, I will happily add that. Anyone else? Anyone else? Everyone wants lunch now, don't they? Okay. I mean, just on the subject of ILOs and remote management, has anybody used the iDRAC 7 stuff on the shared network board? It sucks. <laughs> and then done a service network restart, and the network didn't come back. <laughs> and then the iDRAC didn't come back, because that's on the same network port. How many thousands of miles away were you? Uh, in this case, um, Lucian was about <coughs> 20 meters away from the machine, so it was a phone call for me, and then a 20-minute walk for him. But yeah, it's, uh, it's painful. All of, all of our servers are located in, in New Jersey, or at least most of them are. And we're, we're based in the UK, so that this was something we had to be acutely aware of when writing this, was although we have a dedicated guy in the data center, we work five hours behind when he starts work. So if we, this kind of had to be written in mind of if we break something, it might be a couple of hours before somebody can actually fix the server for you. That's cool. it, I think. Thanks, thanks, John. Thanks for that.